Welcome to Modern Musings, Conversations with the Maiden, Mother, and Crone, where we look at ourselves and our world through the lens of the 21st century. Hi, and welcome back to this bonus episode of Modern Musings. I'm your host, Cindy Murray, and I'm here with Kristen Hessler and Amber Garvin. Hello. Hey. And we are doing this bonus episode to cover our final two chapters in our read of Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth. The, the next chapter, the final chapter, is where he talks about A New Earth. And he talks about how these things all kind of come together. And, you know, he goes back and forth to some of the things he's mentioned in some of the other chapters. And, um, but he really sums it up in a great way. He, he starts out by talking about your life. And um, people talk about, and I think we've talked about this before in an earlier chapter, about how people say, yeah, I wanted to be a blah, blah, blah. You know, I wanted to be a rock star, but life got in the way. Or um, right. I wanted to do this, but life got in the way. Um, but Age he's talking teeth. about there is no such thing as your life. You are, are your life. life. Yeah. You are life itself. And nothing happens that is not meant to happen. Which is to say that nothing happens that's not part of the greater whole and its purpose. Right? Mm -hmm. So, and we've, we've, we've touched on that a lot of times too. Um, you know, what's meant for you is not going to pass you by. Um, th you know, things are meant to happen. Serendipity, synchronicity, whatever you want to call, you know, these things, they're, they're, Destiny, you know, some people say destiny. Um, well, I mean, um, I'm gonna talk, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, like, uh, things can come to you and pass you by, but that just means that you're not meant for it at that yes. moment. If it's meant for you, if it's it won't, meant, pass it'll you come by. back, yeah. you know, or it'll come back, it'll yeah. come back to you if it's. Something that you're not ready for. Exactly. It'll pass you by. And then if you, when you're ready for it, if that it's meant to be, it will come back. There is the choice to miss opportunity though. When those opportunities do come to you and you let fear stop you. Well, yes. Then yeah, at some point it stops knocking. What is that? The Nagel? The that, niggle, listen the to the niggle. niggle. Listen yes. to the niggle. Yes. If you get that idea. That's your intuition. That's your yeah. intuition. Like, hey, you know, after a while, like, it goes away and it goes to someone else. Or something. Yeah. Or it gets louder Which, and louder until it slaps you upside the head. Yeah, that too. Which is the subject of a future podcast called Big Magic. <laughs> um, so, but he, he says sometimes there's a destruction or a disruption of your outer purpose. Uh, like, so, you know, maybe you have an outer purpose of being a, a doctor um, and something happens. Maybe you get sick and you can't go, you can't finish med school, but it leads you to finding your inner purpose. And, um, and then once you've found your inner purpose, a new and deeper outer purpose arises that's in alignment with that inner purpose. And I think that that has happened too. You know, there's um how many people have, you know, gotten cancer and then figured out that what I really need to be doing is writing a book. Or um you know, I what I really need to be doing is volunteering for this charity or whatever. And I think that I think that does happen with some people, but sadly, um as as he points out, some people never get it. Um when they they get to old age and they realize that they've hardened their ego, their ego has gotten so hard and um, it, it like makes a shell. And then, then they have no purpose, they have no outer purpose anymore. 
And so they spend the rest of their days whining, complaining. Um, you know, everybody knows old people like that. You know, they they live in self-pity or anger or guilt or they blame everyone else for how bad they are. Um, whatever other negative emotional states and 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 they're just, or they're just like attached to their memories and they live in the past all the time and and that's that's the ego again you know it just if they don't ever awaken to their inner purpose their ego will just sit there and kind of crystallize or petrify mm-hmm. you know and and it's a hardened heart it is a hardened heart yes and But if your ego is not a factor anymore, um, then when you get to old age uh, or death, you know, uh, near death or whatever, then it becomes what it's what he says it's meant to be, which is an opening into the realm of spirit. And he he talks about people who are accepting of old age, real, really, really old people, you know. Um, and they're, and they're just accepting that they're old or people who are on the, you know, the cusp of death or whatever, but they're radiant in their life. Even though they're, they're about to die, they are just, you know, glowing with the acceptance and they're happy. And, and that happens with people. It, it really does. I've seen people that way too. And, um, if you're struggling or if you have stress in your life, then that, even if you've awakened, if you go back to having stress or to struggling, then that means your ego has returned. And any negative reactions that we have when we encounter obstacles, those are always the ego returning as well. And I, uh, I I mentioned this to my um, counselor when I was doing therapy the other day or a while back, and and I laughed because I actually used it in my one little word also um, when I was talking about now and how my attitude about certain things has changed. And we had gone uh, camping with my family we were canoeing down the Brazos River, and um, Kristen and I were in a canoe together. And uh, we came we came across a, a a little patch where the the water was really shallow, and we kind of bottomed out the canoe, and it wouldn't go any further. And I am um, I don't like to get in and out of the canoe. I I feel very unsteady. I'm very fearful of it. Um, it it, it just scares me because I've had surgeries on both my knees and, and I'm, I'm just not very steady. And this is we're we've got this canoe in this fast running water and uh, we're trying to get it off the rocks. I have to get out of the canoe. Kristen is already out of the canoe and tried to move it and it still wouldn't move. So we both had to get out. I had, um, my granddaughter Raina is in the middle of the canoe And, uh, Kristen's holding the canoe while I'm trying to get out and the, um, the canoe starts moving down. It's trying to go down the river with the water and I've got one foot in and one foot out and I am freaking out because this canoe is about to make me do the splits over the side of the canoe. So, uh, you know, I, I am like full on almost panic mode here because I'm afraid this thing is going to keep moving and it's going to wash this canoe down the river because Kristen's trying to hold it and she's not strong enough to hold it to keep it from moving. I can't stop it because I'm half in and half out of the canoe and, and it won't quit moving enough where I can finish getting out. And I'm afraid this canoe is going to get away from Kristen it's going to move further and I'm going to do splits, you know, Mind right you, the water is like mid calf deep. Yeah. Less. It's not very it's deep. I'm shallow. not, that's I'm why not... we had to get out. Cause we got stuck on the <laughs> yeah. rocks and, and I'm, I'm not really worried about getting wet or anything like that. I'm just worried. I'm going to fall on my knee because this canoe is moving 
and, you know, and bust up my knee again or whatever, uh, or that the canoe is going to get away from both of us and go rushing you know, down the river, rushing down the river with Raina in it, um, and no way to control it, you know? And, and so I'm freaking out a little bit. So I'm, I'm in this canoe and I'm, you know, I'm, it's literally fixing to split me in half, you know, if I don't move one of my feet either into the canoe or out of the canoe. And I finally just lifted up my foot and let myself fall into the, into the river, right on my butt, you know, and like I say, this is, I, I don't even think it was calf deep. I think it was like ankle, ankle deep, deep. Yeah. <laughs> ankle deep. And, and I just, uh, you know, once I got out of the canoe, then Kristen could get the canoe turned and hold on to it a little bit. And it wasn't moving anymore because it was mainly moving because my weight was still in that canoe and it was trying to take it down, down river a little bit, which was really weird because when she got out of the canoe, it was stuck. But once I got half of my, you know, one leg out, it's it, a little less weight. It was in just the a canoe. little less weight it in that canoe. It popped up on top of the water and it was ready to it go. It was ready to go. And, and, I can tell you, I was terrified. That was fear. That was fear. The uncertainty of what was about to happen caused a great deal of fear in me. But the minute I was like, okay with, okay, I don't know what's going to happen. And I just let myself fall. I, it, it quit moving. I just died laughing. And I realized in that moment that I had surrendered to what is now. You stopped resisting. I stopped resisting what was trying to happen. I just accepted what is. And I embraced what what is. And that was when I realized how much of a change, how much of an impact this book has made for me. Because until that point, it was just all about trying to live in the now. And at that point, that was when I realized this has really changed the way I look at life in, in so many ways. Um, accepting that uncertainty, allowing what was going to happen, me falling, to happen. Um, and then just enjoying it. I literally enjoyed it. I laughed so hard and my husband had gotten out of his canoe and he was standing at a little distance off and I was like you got to take a picture of this so I actually had him take a picture of me in the water laughing about it and and I did have bruises all over my legs after that um but it you know I was imagining the worst case scenario and that's not what happened it was far far less than that and I just, I really feel like that was a big, big turning point for me, you know, a full year after I read this book, that it, it's still sinking in in a lot of ways, but um, I quit letting the negative reactions to what was going on be part of it. My, I let my ego go. Um, I quit worrying about my safety or what was going to happen to me and just let it happen. And I think that's a, a really important part of that. Um, I think for everyone, their experiences when they read the book and they do have that enlightening moment, wherever it lands in the book, if they do have it right it for would be for different reasons even well it, well, it is because yeah. we all have our own ego that does yes. what it does because it does it for whatever those reasons are like right you know some people get angry whenever things happen or don't happen and some people get scared when things happen or don't happen and some people make irrational decisions well this is true and that you know this is one of the things though that th in that moment when that happened, I was thinking back to the person I was the year before. Mm -hmm. um, when I started laughing, I thought to myself, Cindy from last year would have been mad. I would have been so mad. I would have been yelling at Kristen for not holding the, 
Yeah, and I did yell at her a little bit until I realized. Once you gave in, and then you were like, oh, oh, it's only ankle deep. Yes, I just let it go. And, but, but I would have still been mad. Yeah. And you I would have blamed it on me, like the whole, or yeah. yourself, or someone else in one of the other canoes for not rescuing us. Yes, I, I would have, I would have placed blame. I would have been angry. I would have been, you know, now look at the, you know, that, that's just where I was. Or I would have just been so worked up and so afraid that the fear, you know, caused all these negative emotions to surface and, and it just, that's where I was a year ago. And this book has really affected me that way. I, like I said, this is the reason that I wanted to read this book because and and having read it twice now i i just keep gleaning more information out of it that see that stuff different every time every time every time um one of the things he also talks about is manifesting and we've talked about manifesting on the blog before you know if if you if you haven't <laughs> oh, and the podcast yes um if you haven't gone back and and listened to those episodes or read those blogs Go back and check those out because um, there's a lot of really great information there. But um, he he talks about manifesting, and um, there's a lot of thoughts about manifesting. And he says, action, although necessary, is only a secondary factor in manifesting our external reality. Um, it's not the pri the actions that you do are not the primary part of manifesting things in your life first. it's the mindset first it really is um our state of consciousness creates our world and if we don't change at that inner level then no amount of action that we can ever do is going to make any kind of difference um we only recreate modified versions of the same world over and over and over again and and it's a external reflection of the ego and I, I find this to be particularly true because you have to believe that it's possible. Um, and not only that it's possible, but that you already have it. Um, and that goes back to the, the movie, The Secret. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the big secret is that you already believe it. You already know that you are successful. You already know that you are are um good at your job you already know that you are a better weight you are more healthy you are in a healthy relationship whatever when you believe that then you make it so your actions will reflect that the universe will reflect that back to you and um and, but if you don't believe that, then it doesn't matter how hard you work. If you don't believe that you're successful, you will not be successful. Very true. It's, it is. Um, and then he talks about um, when you align your outer purpose, and you, you already know what your inner purpose is, what you do, or your inner purpose is, is your awakening and staying awake, staying conscious, um, aware of your connectedness to the world. And you, and you align that to your outer purpose. Um, then what you're doing becomes awakened doing. And, um, the consciousness flows into your thoughts and inspires them. And it flows into what you do and it guides you and empowers you. The irony. The irony? Because you're talking about being awake and awakening. And oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Amber's having a hard time over here. <laughs> um, but it, so it's, he talks again about it's not what you do, but how you do it that determines whether you're fulfilling your destiny. And then, and from that, he goes into the three main things. And this is, 
this is where this kind of gets a little bit, uh, the, the short rows, I guess, of this discussion. And, and this is the part where it really started to hit me. So he talks about, um, what he calls the three modalities of awakened doing. So awakened doing again is when you're, inner purpose has aligned with your outer purpose. Your outer purpose is doing something that is in alignment with your inner purpose. And that is awakened doing. And when you are experiencing awakened doing, um, then that's, that's your destiny or whatever. And, um, so there's three modes of it. He calls them acceptance enjoyment and enthusiasm and Krista just talked about enjoyment a minute ago yeah and I really um this is this is a really um cool part of that so he's talking about acceptance but he he starts out by saying if it doesn't come from acceptance enjoyment or enthusiasm then it's coming from your ego Mm -hmm. and I think that's true too because if it's something that you hate then there's a reason why you're doing it or the reason why you're not doing it or not. So doing it like, or whatever. and, and that's why it made me think of like, cause that the word, when I was thinking of enjoy, I was just bouncing off of someone else's word. That was play this yes. year. And I was like, Oh, that's a fun word. I want a fun word. So I thought enjoy, um, because then I can make the things that I struggle with not enjoying fun. Yes. Right. Yes. And because that is one of the super secrets of of getting through crap that you don't like to do is to find some way to make it fun. Right. And so I looked at like, okay, what are the goals that I'm struggling with this year and why what's holding me back? Like, it's all me. It's not an external right thing that's keeping me from my goal. It's, you know, you know, my I, the one that I always struggle with the most obviously is health. And the most thing that I struggle oh, with too. probably with that is exercise. And oh, the reason yeah, why too. I don't exercise is because it's not, un, it's not comfortable. It's pain avoidance. Yeah, it is. It is exactly like I was talking about pain avoidance. So I need to find a way to enjoy it so that I am Make not it pleasurable. Yes pain avoidance if it's if it's you know. pleasurable if you enjoy it then right. you're going to and when want I to do, do it. enjoy like when i go to the gym and stuff i do enjoy going to the gym so i'm gotta, like what is yeah. it that's telling me like don't do this it's no fun because it's painful or it's uncomfortable or it's just the act of getting up getting dressed and getting out putting on tennis shoes and going to yeah, the but gym, some whether of it's my, walking across yeah. the apartment complex or driving across town, it's just the act of going there. There's some kind of resistance, but once you're there, it's fine. Yes. Right. And yes. half of the time, like I'm not even talking about going to the gym. Like I'm talking about like just going for a walk or going to ride my bicycle or doing a push up or two every day. Because mm-hmm. if I can do two today, the next week I can do three. But I'm like, I don't want to do that. It's just like, it'll take me like two minutes to do it. But I can sit here and argue for five minutes about how I'm not going to do it. That is, you know, I think some of that is, I I know for me, um, pain avoidance, obviously. Um, It's uncomfortable. It makes me feel bad. Um, It makes me feel bad that I can't already do as many push-ups as I think I should. So I don't want to further embarrass your, embarrass my ego. Right. (laughs) By, you know, it is, it's a protection of my ego. I'm going to pretend, I'm just not going to do those. And then my ego can pretend that I can do push-ups or whatever, whatever it is, you know, but that's what it is. I don't want to face the fact that I can't even do one push-up, much less three. And, Um, you know, so there's, there's that aspect of it. I don't want to acknowledge that. There's also, you know, the, the pain avoidance of like going for a walk. Um, it, you know, half the year here, it's hot, it's hot, you know, we're in 90 degree weather. I don't don't want to be dirty and then I'll have to take a shower and it takes time. It takes time. It takes me away from things that I 
would so rather locks, be doing. And then you'd have like, to choose between yes. brushing your teeth or taking a shower. And those things are all related to the ego. Every one of those are related to the ego. None of them are from my inner inner purpose or or whatever. So he talks about um, these three modes. And the first mode is not enjoyment. It is actually acceptance. acceptance. Yeah. And um, this was a, some really powerful stuff here because he's talking about if you can't enjoy doing it, at least accept that it's what you have to do. Uh, you know, make it a part of your routine and just go, this is the way it is. This is what I have to do. For right. now, this is the situation. In this moment, this is what I, is required of me to do. And I am doing it willingly. Willingly right. accepting what it is. And I think that that would work with the um, exercise thing. Um, if I actually told myself. You know, if I actually used that on myself. Um, accepting what you must do is just another aspect of accepting what happens about accepting what is. And um, he says it may look passive, but really it's an active and creative exercise because exercise, see, I use that word <laughs> um, because it brings something new into the world. You are, you're bringing in peace when you actually accept that you have to do that job. And you're not resisting it. And you're you not resisting that you're at a peace, peace at creator. it. Yeah, you, it, you're creating peace in yourself. And that subtle energy vibration, I love that word, vibration. Um, mm -hmm. The metaphysical people talk about vibrations mm -hmm. all the time. Um, and everything is energy. Good we are made up. Oh, <laughs> we are all made up of energy. And, you know, and our even our cells kind of vibrate in a in a way and so he says that that inner peace that subtle energy vibration is consciousness and and it's one of the ways that that consciousness enters the world is through surrendered action when you surrender to what you're doing um then you are fully in the moment um and you know, a good example of this is the the monks, the Tibetan monks or whatever, that just every day they're just sweeping the grounds, just sweeping, you know, sweep, sweep, sweep. And they're, you know, it's drudgery, you know, <laughs> but they, they're just fully in that moment and enjoying it and doing what they have to do. Uh, nuns who are down on their hands and knees and just scrubbing the floor, uh, you know, of the nunnery or whatever that they're doing that in a spiritual way. They are just fully in that moment. And I've, I've actually had short moments of that where I was doing things like that. Um, fully conscious, fully aware, just, being in that moment and doing that thing. And it is, it's a very Zen kind of feeling. Yeah. I think like, you know, talking about the canoe trip, because to me, that's just like the wildest, craziest thing at one of the wildest, craziest things I've ever done. You know, it's just a canoe going down a river, but for 20 I'm miles, putting my yes. faith in nature and just trusting other people to get me there alive, you know, yeah. over the course of three days yeah. and we have all our food and everything. I know that I have to paddle that canoe. It is not going to get to the other end. That's a without perfect example. my effort. Yes. It's, and it's, you know what? My arms do not get tired. You would think that you would, I mean, it is exhausting. Yes. But it's just as exhausting as if I had to do like two push ups. Like, I feel like it's very comparable because yeah. I make those two push ups. I'm just using that as an example. I'm not a push upper, but <laughs> push upper. Okay. Yes. I mean, I make that way so much. Yeah. It's so heavy. It's yes. so daunting and and yeah. everything. But like I literally, but yeah, you can canoe row that canoe for paddle. twenty miles. Pardon me, oh, my husband paddle. paddle. My husband would get mad at me. We paddle the canoe, 
for uh, 20 miles. For 20 miles. And and you're Yeah, you're you're tired, but it's a fun tired and it's and it is. You're when you're paddling, you're just in the moment. Right, and you're not griping and moaning the whole way like, oh, why oh, am I so even tired. here? This is why horrible. Do I have to keep paddling? Because that wouldn't make it fun. No. It you're just doing it and it it's work. It's work. It's hard work. But you're just paddling away and you're just so at peace. I think some people are that way when they're working in their garden. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, and there there are people who do that in their jobs. And he talks about that, too. And those are the people who are really exceptionally good at the jobs that they do. Um I, I think my husband is one of those people because he's, when he is, uh, he's an audio engineer, so he mixes sound and records sound. And I think he is so enthralled with that work or when he's writing music or whatever. He's, he's in flow. He's totally in flow. And, and I think that is what makes him such an excellent engineer and he is really a high, highly qualified engineer really good um taught me everything i know <laughs> and um and so you know he is really good at it and and there are doctors um who are just so passionate about doctoring that they are just the best doctors and they're uh a, Someone who comes to mind immediately um, was Dennis, the pastor at the UU church that we used to go to. And he was just such a, uh, so passionate about his sermons, if you want to call it. I guess it's a sermon. Um, but he he was just so very good at it because he was in it. He was just there in it. And I loved that. I thought that was awesome. Um, he, Tolly goes on to say that if, if you can't enjoy or accept those things that you must do, then you need to just stop because that activity is not for you. You're just making yourself miserable and there's no sense in it. Um, if you, if you can't make yourself Find something good to enjoy about washing the dishes. Then why are you torturing yourself? Right? But don't we still need to wash the dishes? Like, you don't, you're not going to Can you not get somebody else to wash the dishes? I guess you could, yeah. yeah. I mean, not everyone has that option, well, though. I, I mean, I, think, I live by I myself. Think the I point have to wash is, my own or, dishes. You know, uh, and maybe washing the dishes wasn't the best example. Maybe you're doing a job. Maybe the job you work at yeah. is something that you're absolutely miserable about and you hate it and you can't do it. You don't want to, you know, you can't make yourself happy doing it. Then stop and go find something else. Um, I don't think that it's impossible to make yourself happy doing the dishes. I think... You can find a way to be fully present and wash the dishes, well, whether it's by getting someone to help you. Actually, there's a whole like thing about that. Yeah. Doing the dish, being present while washing the dishes. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, that scrubbing the toilets or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. it's, but you know, don't scrub the toilet with enthusiasm. You will get sprayed. <laughs> Mm. Okay, so we're and not going to get all over your toothbrush. No, no, and... we're not going back there. No, <laughs> no. Um, so the, the next step is enjoyment. So, you know, beyond acceptance is enjoyment. And Kristen was talking about this earlier, about doing things with enjoyment. And um, if you can accept things, then a lot of times you can find a way to enjoy it. But... But the accepting, and that's that's where the dishwashing comes in. You know, maybe you can't enjoy washing the dishes, but you can. That's what I'm saying. You, you can you accept have it. You to accept that. You have it is to a accept it. It's a necessity. It's got to be done. 
I'm not going to complain about it anymore. It is what it is. It has right. to be done. And I'm that's just a really good it. point. What's the point in complaining? It still has to get done. Yes. You can spend more energy complaining about it or just do it. You're just making yourself miserable is basically what it is. Um, but when you, uh, th- that piece of surrendered action turns into a sense of aliveness when you actually enjoy what you're doing. Um, I have certain household things that I don't mind doing. I actually enjoy them. Um, For me, it's the accomplishment of finishing something mm -hmm. and getting through it and checking something off your list that you did. Okay, yeah. You, You can't do it. From the ego, though. Right. That's, that's... You can't sit there and scrub the dishes because it's going to look so nice in here when I'm done. Yes. It has to be. Well, I'm doing this because accomplished it accomplished needs... when you're done because you, you know, you right, did something. Right, but that something. just feeds your ego, though. Um, because yeah. your that's ego what... wants to be validated so for doing the dishes. Yes. He's talking about enjoying the process. And I think that is the, like the sweeping raking leaves you know i've raked leaves there's been times when i really enjoyed raking leaves it was enjoyable uh enjoying gardening Mm -hmm. um pulling weeds wow that was one that i used to love to do i would just go outside and just sit in the grass and pull weeds it's it's a very meditative process and that one i i would thoroughly enjoy it i unless it's like 100 degrees out but um So there's, you know, there's lots of things like that. And he said, joy is the dynamic aspect of being. When the creative power of the universe becomes conscious of itself, it manifests as joy. I like that. I like that. He, and he talks about also the, the waiting to start living syndrome. Mm-hmm. And I know we've all, we've probably talked about it. We've when probably done I'm it. When I'm rich, I'll be happy. Yeah. Um, or, uh, you know, when we, when we pay off all this debt, we can go on a vacation and live. Mm-hmm. When we, we'll be happy when the cars are paid off. We'll be blah, blah, blah. And he's talking about don't wait for something to change to help you start enjoying what you do. You just have to, those positive changes are going to be more likely to come if you're actually already enjoying what you do. So um, don't say, I have to wait until I finish this project to enjoy my day. Or my like good waiting to bust out the china for a special occasion. Just eat off of your fancy plates. Yes, uh, which we do at my house. We eat yeah. off the fancy plates. We ate off of Christmas plates <laughs> because we didn't. They were like all being washed in the dishwasher, and I was like, you know what? We're gonna pull out these Christmas china plates and eat off oh, of them there in you the go. middle of the summer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but he's talking about you know a lot of people get they have to have permission. You know, I, ca- I can't enjoy my life until I've retired. Then I can go on vacation and do the things I want to do. Don't do that. Uh, don't ask your mind for permission to enjoy what you do. Just enjoy what you do or find something else to do. Um, if you wait for tomorrow to start enjoying things, tomorrow will never come. So enjoy what you're doing now. Here we go now again. Joy does not come from what you do. It flows into what you do and into the world from within you. It comes from how you do it. And you will enjoy any activity in which you are fully present. Any activity that's not just a means to an end. And that's what I was talking about, Amber. The, you know, it can't come from the desire to check it off your list. It the has reward, to be. Yeah. The means is, is, it's not just a means to an end. It has to be the purpose for doing it is just the doing of it. Right. Yeah. And um, he he has a way 
to help you um, kind of learn to do this. And it, it's a spiritual practice. And he says, what you need to do is make a list of all your everyday routines. Include all the things that you think are uninteresting, boring, tedious, irritating, stressful, and don't, but don't include anything that you hate or detest, okay? And so whenever you've got that list and whenever you are engaged in one of those activities, let them be a vehicle for alertness. Be absolutely present in what you do and sense the alert, alive stillness within you in the background of the activity. So have you taken, um, you know, how we have like our little like daily agendas, uh, like with our planner? Yes. You know, we yes. have, we have both have a little like dashboard that we put in our planner of like all the things we want to accomplish on a daily basis. Routine. Yes. Have you ever taken that and looked at your routine and went, wow, look at this thing that I hate doing or anything like that? It makes me want to pull my dashboard out and look at it. You know, I haven't, but that kind of makes me think about that, you know, um, because, yeah, there's probably a lot of things on there I could cross off as I don't want to, I hate it. Um, but, but, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know. Like taxes. Now, I have hate looked at my taxes. taxes. I do hate doing Well, I don't really hate doing my taxes. I don't, um, which is kind of weird. I actually, in, a, in fact, I think I talked about this um, with my counselor the, during therapy um, a while back um, because I was still working on my taxes at that point because I had to file an extension this year. And I was really frustrated with it because I was like, I hate taxes. I hate taxes. But then, well, as I was talking to her, I was like, you know, I really don't hate the taxes. I really don't. Um, I hate that they consume so much of my time. And, um, and I hated that I was so far behind on them. And I used to actually enjoy tax season every year because I would just sit and sort. It's all... It's sorting and number crunching and, um, you know, making spreadsheets and charts or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, I did all these things. And I like, I like that work. I do. Um, because it's kind of tedious, in a way, mindless even, um, and maybe that, maybe that's the point. It is. It's a little just bit mindless. Kind of organizing. Um, I'm just kind of organizing, and I'm just kind of fully in it. At you know, I'm not doing anything else. I'm not watching TV. I'm not, you know, doing anything while I'm doing it. So I am fully present while I'm doing it, and and so I do kind of enjoy it. But when I'm rushed, when I have to do a bunch of it, that's when it becomes unenjoyable um and he he really says if you if you can um be fully alert while you're doing it and and be open to that then you it will actually become enjoyable because you will enjoy that alertness and you will want to be in that state more often um if you feel that your life lacks significance or is too stressful or tedious, it's because you haven't brought that dimension into your life yet. And, you know, he the, the title of this chapter is A New Earth. And, you know, he, he kind of takes a roundabout way of getting to it. But he does say it, it, there with the enjoyment part that the, the new earth will come when more people discover that their life's purpose is to bring the light of consciousness into this world and so use whatever they do as a vehicle for that consciousness that's so i thought that was kind of interesting because that he's talking about if you're doing enjoyment if you're enjoying what you're doing which is the awakened doing and you're enjoying it if you're fully present in it then you will come to enjoy it when you come to enjoy it 
then you are fully conscious in it. You're bringing that consciousness forward. And that when more people start doing that, then the, the new earth will come. And the joy of being is the joy of being conscious. So, but he does say, be careful not to let it go to your head. Because your ego is still sitting there waiting to catch you at it. And you're still just a human. And whatever, anything that you could do that is extraordinary is not you doing something extraordinary. It's something extraordinary coming through from the whole. Through you. And... Um, he closes that little section up by talking about 14th century Persian poet and Sufi master Havis, who said, I am a hole in a flute that the Christ's breath moves through. That's like a very, ins not insignificant. Oh, that is like the poet of all poets in yeah. Persian culture. Yeah. Yes. Havis. And. Um, and he, he's talking about, I'm a hole in a flute that Christ's breath moves through. So I'm like this tiny little part of it, but I'm allowing, I, because I'm a hole. You make the specific sound. The hole in the flute is what makes, makes that specific that sound. sound. Uh, but you're just part of a bigger thing. Christ's breath is blowing through this flute and you're just one little hole in it. Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and and then he points out you know listen to the music don't pay attention to the little hole that's the ego the ego is saying oh i'm the important part i'm the, I'm hole. the a note uh, yes <laughs> but <Literally. laughs> but he's saying no listen to the music listen to the all the little things that that come through there and i thought that was very poetic you know um mm -hmm. i like that part um the last part of that, um, the third modality that he talks about is enthusiasm. And, you know, you move from enjoyment into enthusiasm. And he says that um, creative manifestation uh, with people who remain true to their inner purpose of awakening Um they suddenly one day know what their outer purpose is. So they've awakened, they're remaining true to that inner purpose, and then all of a sudden one day they know what their purpose is, they have a great vision, a goal, and from then on they work towards implementing that goal. And those are the people who do things with enthusiasm. Those are the people who move mountains. Those are the people who create great charities or who sail the seven seas, uh, fly to the moon, you know, that is enthusiasm that does that. And enthusiasm means there's a deep enjoyment in what you do. You're enjoying what you do so deeply um, that you've added an element of a goal or a vision to what you work towards. And I think I have that... Um, towards modern musings. I, that for me is an enthusiasm. I, since we started this whole process, I've felt that enthusiasm towards what we are doing. I enjoy every single moment of everything that we do with modern musings. And I will say there's, there's little parts of it. Like I edit the podcast myself, um, and put the music and on it and tedious. all that stuff. It's a little bit tedious, but I do enjoy it. I've learned to enjoy it. I actually went to school to learn um, to be an audio engineer. And until we started Modern Musings, I had not worked as an audio engineer um, in more than 30 years. So um, I wasn't sure I would like it. I was a little afraid of it. Um, but I kind of surrendered to the fact that it needed to be done. And I learned that I actually enjoy it. 
And but the like the podcasting part, the writing part, I have a lot of enthusiasm for mm-hmm. that. And and I it, you know, it's 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 enjoyment with that with that added goal of a purpose. There's a reason for it. Um I have a goal, I have a vision. Um I think all of us do probably in some form or another. Mm-hmm. And the energy field or vibrational frequency changes when you do things with enthusiasm and you will feel like an arrow that is moving towards the target and enjoying the journey. Um, and how, you know, it's not enthusiasm or enlightened. That's when you want to arrive at the goal more than you want to be doing what you're doing. So, so, you know, if all I was worried about was, how many listeners we have or how many readers we have or whatever, then that goal is becomes more important than what we're doing. And I'm perfectly happy and enjoying the actual podcasting and the writing and, and all of those aspects of it. And that's how I know that what I'm doing is enlightened and with enthusiasm. And, um, if you become stressed about it though, or if you're worried about, you know, that goal, then that means that that's a sign that the ego is returned. And I'm not really worried about the goal. I, if the, if we have one listener, I'm, I'm thrilled. Um, I'm actually really happy that we have more than one listener, but you know, even if only one person was listening to us and getting something out of it. Um, that is still a win in my book because I have so much enthusiasm for what we're putting into it. And, um, he actually, he has, I have a couple of little things here that he talks about enthusiasm. Um, and one of them is, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, nothing great has ever been achieved without enthusiasm. And I think that's absolutely true. Are you going to say that for like any uh, American or any other country? But I'm yeah, thinking about the American entrepreneurs like Rockefeller and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. You know, like they did what they did because they were they enthusiastic, were enthusiastic about, about yes. whatever they were working on or whatever they were doing. Um, the, you know, Lewis and Clark discovered, you know, uh, charted you know, parts of the Americas because they were enthusiastic about it or whatever. Um, and he also has, uh, another interesting thing that he used. Um, he talks about the, 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 um, origins of the word, uh, enthusiasm. And it, it comes from the Greek N and Theos. And when you put those together, it means to be possessed by a God. And if you think about it, if somebody was possessed by a God, they would be really enthusiastic about whatever the God wanted, you know, out of it. So, so that you're kind of possessed by this desire, this drive. And, and I, I think that was, that's kind of a cool way to look at it. Um, sustained enthusiasm brings a wave of creative energy. And he says, just ride the wave, ride the wave. Um, and he does talk about there being a strong link between stress and negative emotions. And, and this we've known to be true that these negative emotions, stress, anxiety, anger, those are toxic to the body. And so you really... Um, you really want to avoid those things. If you're starting to get stressed and you're, the ego is directing what you want to do, you know, you need to kind of hold up and, um, you know, just say, why am I doing this? Because it's not good for you. It's not bringing something beautiful into the world it's um it's, it's walking just, your energy it's your causing chi. you pain it's yeah it's it's uh yeah so um he also he he quoted jesus quite a bit in uh 
throughout the book. And I thought it was interesting um, that in this section he put um, a, a quote from Jesus, I can of my own self do nothing. And that goes back to don't let it be your ego that is driving you because it's really um, when you're at that enthusiasm stage, if, if it's your ego, if you think it's all you, then that's your ego. And it's really not your, you that's creating this. It's the universe as a whole, the whole, the source, the being is creating whatever this is through you because you are open, aware, and present. And when you're open, aware, and present, then that consciousness can because move through you. Because you are the whole and the flute. Yes. Um, and he also says, uh, he talks about how you know whether it's enthusiasm or not, or if it's of the ego. Uh, enthusiasm never opposes. It is non-confrontational. It doesn't create winners or losers. It is based on inclusion, not exclusion. Enthusiasm gives out of its own abundance. Enthusiasm and the ego cannot coexist. And this reminded me, when I was reading it, of uh, a, a verse in the Bible. It's 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. That is the verse that says, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil but rejoices in the truth, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And I've always loved that verse, but it, it, it actually brings new meaning when you look at it in light of Eckhart Tolle talking about how um, the enthusiasm never opposes. It's, it's not envious. It's not rude. It's not proud. Mm -hmm. um, those things are of the ego. All of these things that um, Paul the Apostle is talking about in Corinthians, these are all the things that, are, that come from enthusiasm. Love. Enthusiasm. Like one and the same. Right. Really, one and the same. Um, he does talk about how enthusiasm is transient. Um, this one, he talks about love never fails. You know, Paul, Paul does. Um, Tully says that enthusiasm is transient. Uh, you can't live in that state all of the time. Um, when you're aligned with your purpose, there is no ego. And so there's no attachment to any kind of outcome or, um, anything like that. So once your wave of creative energy passes away, you still have joy in what you're doing, but not that enthusiasm. Um, but as long as you keep doing what you're doing in joy, then eventually another wave of creative energy will come later and re and you will have renewed enthusiasm. Um, enjoyment of what you're doing combined with a goal or a vision that you work toward becomes enthusiasm. So we, you know, you, you move from acceptance. Once you accept things, you can learn to enjoy it. Once you combine a goal or a vision to your enjoyment, then it becomes enthusiasm. And even though you have a goal, you are, it's what you are doing in the present moment that is what has to be the focal point, the doing. 
Otherwise, you fall out of alignment with your universal purpose. Um, and you have to make sure that your goal is not focused on having this or that. Your goal can't be about being rich or having a fancy car or whatever. Those are static goals and they don't empower you. You have to make sure that your goal is not an inflated image of yourself, which is just a concealed form of ego. So, um, yeah, you can't, your goal can't be to be a famous person because that's just ego. Mm -hmm. Um, hence rock star. (laughs) Yeah. Rock star mentality or whatever. Yeah. Uh, he says instead, make sure your goals are dynamic and they point towards an activity and that you're gay. You are engaged in and, and you work through that activity um, and that you're connected to other human beings as well as to the whole. Um, see yourself inspiring people with your work and enriching their lives. Yeah. That is a powerful thing. Feel yourself being an opening, that hole in the flute, through which the energy flows from the unmanifested source of all life through you for the benefit of all. So if you are um, if you are a Christian, if you are um, a monotheist, then you can feel, you know, you can lo- align yourself so that you can feel yourself being an opening from God, an opening through which God can come through into the world. Through you, you are channeling that being. Um, and he goes on to talk about right, again, you can't manifest what you want, you can only manifest what you already have. That's that go back to believing that you already have it. And here again, he quotes Jesus again. And who said, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. So it, it really fascinates me. If you go back and study the scriptures in the light of the things that Eckhart Tolle has talked about, it's really quite fascinating because you kind of see different things. And and that's where he starts talking about the new earth and the and the um the origin of that title comes from John uh in Revelations who wrote and I saw a new heaven and a new earth and he goes on to talk about this this new heaven and earth that were magical you know all, mm-hmm. all good all the bad was gone and and really if you think about it if everybody lived their life in this way where they accepted the things that they had to do whether they liked it or not if they enjoyed the work they did and if they were enthusiastic about things that that they did that uh, were done in such a way that they helped others and they were aligned with your purpose what an incredible world we would live in. And, and he said, you know, he, he doesn't say it in this words, but I see it, um, uh, written in many different ways. I have some Oracle cards, um, that phrase it this way. It's happening and it, and it's closer than you think, um, that the world is changing. People are becoming more aware. People are, opening their awakening they are uh that spirituality is changing it, it with leaps and bounds now i i look at i mean there's always been like a metaphysical uh culture in our it, you know here in america 
but I look at the boom of it. Yeah, people are coming out of the they're, metaphysical it, closet. Out of the metaphysical closet, absolutely. They're it, they're open to sharing that these are the things that they have been exploring. And it is much more mainstream now than it has ever been. And I think that is a part of that awakening. And just because you are awakened metaphysically does not mean that you can't uh, be of another religion, that you can't be spiritual in another faith as well. And I've, I've talked about that before. Um, a lot of people think, well, you can't believe in metaphysical stuff if you're a Christian or you can't believe in Christian stuff if you are into the metaphysical stuff. And that's absolutely. Or if you're an atheist. Or if you're an atheist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so, you know, that is absolutely not true. Um, it's all about just opening yourself and, you know, really listening to um, the message that the universe is trying to tell you and, and just being accepting that that's where the, the, um, the religion sometimes comes into conflict because people are people of certain religions are not open to accepting other thoughts. And, and I'm not talking about saying that there's, um, you know, 15 gods instead of one God or anything like that. I'm just talking about the purely spiritual act of knowing that we are all interconnected, um, with all of nature, that we aren't necessarily as separate as we think we are, um, even Jesus said, heaven is right here in the midst of you. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And uh, Tully talks about the meek are the egoless people. The awakened right. people they're are the meek. The weak. They're, they're not the weak. weak. They're he mild, say they're tempered, weak. mild mannered, calm, generous, courteous, open, accepting. Yes, that is what they are. And those who are awakened are growing. It is growing in leaps and bounds. And it will eventually change all aspects of life on our planet. And um, he ends the book with this final phrase. A new species is arising on the planet. It is arising now and you are it. So if you are awakening, you are this new species. You are part of this new earth. You are allowing the consciousness of the whole, the spirit, the being, the whatever you want to call it. You are letting that come through to the earth and you are it. So like... I like the way he says, like, um, you are like a new species because when you think about like human evolution, mm -hmm. you know, the evolution of man is the varying species right. that became right. Cro Magnon, today's Neanderthal, human, whatever. And yes. I, that like resonates with me because I do believe in, um, evolution. And, uh, you know, the evolution of man, because you cannot tell me that we are exactly the same as we were no, physically we and mentally. No. Right. So, um, you know, with this, like they keep talking about the fifth dimension, you know, we're coming in the age of the fifth dimension. That is like our minds are evolving to see the ego and identify that it is like an entity within our brains that we can quiet and b be able to accept and mm -hmm. enjoy mm -hmm. and be enthusiastic. And we don't have to war all the time. We don't have to resist um, things as they are in life, like washing the dishes, you know, like we don't have to let that rule our lives, right? Um, because 
we are awakening as a whole, one person at a time. And it goes right back to the beginning where he's talking about the field of flowers and like the yes. first flower opened and bloomed. They didn't all just pop open at once. Right. One of them popped open and then the one next to it, like the animals f- fleeing the tsunami, they didn't know it. They just did it instinctually. Even right. flowers right. that are not conscious right. are able to evolve. Yeah, I I agree. And it and we are evolving and our our perceptions of what this interconnected consciousness is is evolving and we are opening ourselves to it and like i said i this this book has been so profound uh for me anyway i i just see myself very very differently than i would have even you know a year ago or whatever even even two months ago because like i said rereading the book um every time i read it i pick up more food for thought and i look at things in a little bit different way and it it is it's just a it's an amazing thought to think that we are all so interconnected and that um we are this small piece of the whole the the whole that the we are the whole that Christ's breath blew through you know it not we're not the flute we're not the music we're not the the breath the breath we are we're not Christ uh, you know we're we are just this this small little hole and the our that's our part and obviously it's an important part because there would be no music if there was no hole for right. the air to blow through and you know, but just to like you know because we were talking about you know, all the different scriptures and stuff. And I was reading, you know, these little parts and thinking like, I wonder how many people who are not religious or atheist or don't believe in Christ, um, got to this part of the book and they weren't able to go further. And I would like to think that if you took out of, uh, Hafez, uh, poem, uh-huh. Christ and just put the universe, the big bang, well, that's, and that's what he does. He, you know, he, he uses these quotes from Christ, but he uses the word, um, the source. The source. Right. And that's why I'm saying the big bang. The big bang. The, you know. We are all it. just the breath we're, blowing under the We hole. are all particles of that big bang that have rearranged themselves into, um, into this shape, this human form, all of there is, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember the exact terminology of the, the science behind it, but there's, there's no, um, element that we can create. We cannot create elements. You, you can rearrange elements, um, in, and you in can science. combine them together and you can combine them together and rearrange them or separate them or whatever. But all of the elements that we use to create anything already exist. They are base. Yeah. Elements. Yes. So, um, you know. Well, we were all like in a shaker bottle and the universe shook up and went. And yes. we all rolled so out and became these little, little um, creations so there's, so there's of like, flesh bodies that walk around. and. Yeah. <laughs> And then they started to coalesce into, um, you know, solar system, globs of solar system that made into a sun and then eventually formed into planets. And, uh, and then those planets, you know, cooled and coalesced. And then you've got, 
you know, crust of the earth on them and um, the, you know, the, the plants and then the animals and then the, you know, the, you know. The ecosystem the- becomes a possibility because of the rotation of the planet and the moons and things like that and, and that make yeah. it a possibility. But it's, but, you know, it's Science. Just, we're all part of that. We are all part of that big bang. Yeah. In, in reality, that is what we are. And, you know, if you want to call that big bang God, or if you want to call that big bang the being or the source or, you know, whatever it is that you want to call it, it's still the same thing. Um, maybe you just picture it in your head a little differently. And that's okay. Um, but it's all the same thing. And we are all still part of it. Yeah. Not too We're, too much to worry about dwelling on it because it's already happened in the past. And it's currently happening and it's going to happen. Yes. But it only is what it is right now. Yeah. Well, it's expanding. It's growing. It's unfolding and manifesting in time. So, that was deep, I know, <laughs> and probably very lengthy. I haven't looked at the time yet, um, but it was, a, it was a lot to cover. And like I said, this was the, the most profound part of the book for me, was the, the parts about um, the acceptance and enjoyment and enthusiasm, because that just really... Kind of opened my eyes. That's interesting. That was the most profound for you. The most profound for me was when he talked about that part of the ego that's like the creature that pokes. Oh, yeah. That was... He keeps things stirred up. Yeah. Yes. I identified with that the most because I saw like myself reflecting in that in uh-huh. in ways, and I saw other people. And now oh, when I, I watch that. movies, even though the people aren't real in the movies, I'm like, oh my god, she's so in her ego, you know. <laughs> like uh, you know. I see it in things. Like there's like a a commercial for this reality show, and this woman was like, just tell me you don't love me. You know, just hurry up and say it so we can move on with our lives. And I was just like, oh, Lord, help her. She's like got some fear about being like abandoned. So she's just trying to get it over with and tell him to say that so that, Uh you know, she can prove herself right. Right. So that her ego can curl up and go be sad. Right. 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 Well, and I, I and I'm I see it now. Like <laughs> I, I see it a lot when I'm driving. Uh, you know, the other day Ashley and I were driving, uh, and we we're on the highway, and there's these people that are like just zipping past us. I mean, like I don't drive slow. Okay, I drive over the speed limit always, <laughs> and and these people are like flying by and whipping in and out of cars, and I my immediate thought to that was wow he's got an ego (laughs) but that's also your ego because you see them (laughs) and you're projecting on these people that you don't even know well but no i mean maybe they just enjoy driving fast his ego that made him go that fast because he's not thinking he's not enjoying his drive He's trying to hurry up and get somewhere. Or he just likes to drive really, really fast. No, because he he wasn't just driving really fast. Well, I know. Yeah, he was zipping in and out. But, yeah, some people like that. Or cutting across lanes to get to an exit. You know, there's – we saw some of that, too. And and, and that was – that was my first thought was that was their ego. They they weren't thinking about anybody else. Um, Not – I'm not saying that in a condescending way. I'm saying that in a – um, awareness sort of way. Instead of being mad at them, I'm like looking at them going, oh, that was his ego. They're moving through their ego. They're just doing that, you know. Their Instead of just like driving the same speed limit as everybody else? Uh-huh. Yeah. It's, it's a thought. Anyway. Um... Do you have anything else to contribute to anybody? No, no. no. Okay. I just want to say, yay, we got through Eckhart Tolle. I don't know, y'all lost me like six pages ago. <laughs> I 
I, yeah, I would that was really to long. Have had this conversation when I was away. So if nobody else has anything to say, I'm gonna we'll just end it there. Um, and um, I I do if you haven't read the book, I do encourage you to go through and read the book. Um, if you haven't listened to the other podcasts, I do encourage you to go back and listen to the other podcasts. Um, it really is a very good book. Uh, it was a challenge for me to read and it was a challenge for me to read it twice because, um, you know, he's, he's talking about some lofty ideas and you have to be open to, um, appreciating those ideas or taking the time to just soak them up or taking the time to soak them up, which uh, it, you know, it actually took me a while to soak it up the first time. So, um, but that's where we're going to leave it. And, um, we will probably do another book read, uh, here in a couple of months. And we're going to just start doing, um, when we do a book read, it will be, um, or if we do a book read, we'll do, um, one episode, one episode where we just talk about the book and, um, and not draw them out as long as this one. And I'm glad you stayed with us through the length of this one. It was a, this book was a challenge. It was kind of longer. There's no way we could have discussed all of these topics in one episode. And now that we have it under our belt, we can um, talk about it freely in the, in the podcast when it's applicable and, Hopefully you'll know what we're referring to. So um, I want to give a special thanks out to Red Door Studios and Creative Audio Tech. Uh, thanks for uh, the music and the equipment. And thank you to our listeners for uh, hanging in there with this really long read. And we will see you on our next regularly scheduled podcast. Bye. Bye. Bye.